is carnal, there is this lack of moral adjustment. So that chasm is basically a lack of moral adjustment. Peter, in his attempt to walk on the water, began to sink because he was out of this fear, out of this fear, suited to, mere, to a mere doubting man. A doubting man cannot walk on water. The carnal Christian cannot behave the way that God expects for the simple reason that he is sold in the sin power. He is a slave to his master and his sin. He has not given that sin nature up to God. Now secondly, take note of how carefully this chasm has been surveyed. This chasm exists first in terms of conflicting potentials. There are conflicting potentials going on in the life of this carnal believer. Verses 15 and 7, uh, through 17 state, For I do not understand what I'm doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. So here we see this flash of potentials that's very real. Every true born-again believer has two natures or two selves in them. And he has this old self, this self that's like Adam, this nature that he was born with, which can do nothing right. Now this believer also has a new nature, a new self, and it's the nature of the living God which can do nothing wrong. So he has this nature that can do nothing right, and then he has this nature that can do nothing wrong. 1 John 3, 9 speaks to the nature that can do nothing wrong. It says, everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed, God's seed, remains in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. So we have this nature, this new nature, this nature of God where it, there is no sin, but we also have that flesh where all that sin dwells. Galatians 5.17 speaks of the constant conflict of these two natures. And it says in verse 17 of Galatians 5, For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. So you've got a war here, a conflict, uh, or a conflict. This conflict comes from the fact that these two natures are incompatible and they're irreconcilable. So we have a clash of potentials here. You have that old nature and that new nature, and they are warring. They are not compatible. They are irreconcilable. You cannot reconcile them. You cannot bring them together. The spirit wars against the flesh. Now this chasm... Uh, also exist in terms of conflicting purposes. Verses 18 through 20, if you'll look at those verses with me. For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but it is the sin that lives in me. Now here in this epistle, Paul has already established the fact that there is no one righteous, not even one. Isaiah 64, 6 says, Our righteousness is but filthy rags. Now Sunday night we were uh, going through our Bible study uh, in Crazy Love by Francis Chan. And he made a great point. He kind of defined what that filthy rag looks like. You're going to have to bear with me this morning. This is... Uh, somewhat gross, uh, to put it mildly, it means menstrual garments. It's like holding up a tampon that's dirty and saying, this is my righteousness. That's what our righteousness in of ourselves looks like. That's what righteousness in the flesh looks like. It looks like a used tampon. What mankind involves as being righteous is not righteous at all. For nothing can be truly righteous that springs from a life that's out of touch with God. The carnal believer finds himself at conflicting purposes in that he desires two different qualities of life at the same time and it will not work. You can't live in the flesh and live in the spirit at the same time. They are conflicting against each other. Now this chasm exists furthermore in terms of conflicting 
principles. There are conflicting principles that make this chasm even further apart. Verses 21 through 24. So I discovered this principle when I want to do good, evil is with me. For in my inner self I joyfully agree with God's law. For I see a different law in the parts of my body waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Now here, the apostle sees two spiritual principles. He sees two spiritual laws. And the first is what we might call the law of Sinai, the law of God, the law that God gave to Moses. Now this law is holy, this law is just, this law is good, this law points Paul heavenward, it points him heavenwardly, the standard of behavior is absolute perfection. Because God's minimum requirement consistent with his own holiness is perfection, absolute perfection. Now there's an opposite law that Paul calls the law of sin. Now in the Garden of Eden, when Adam sinned, he placed all mankind under this law. And any so-called science of human uh, behavior that ignores the law of sin will ultimately wander hopelessly astray from the truth. Our schools, our universities have taught every law known to science except that law of sin. No matter what they believe, the fact remains that it is this law of sin that really explains why people do what they do. It is at the root of every behavioral problem. If you see a behavior problem, the root of that is sin. Paul has discovered that while the law of Sinai points him heavenward, the law of sin pulls him hellward. The law of sin acts in the wall around the way that the law of gravity acts or operates in the physical realm. It exerts this downward pull upon us all. Now Paul will next describe a couple of principles that he sees at work within himself. Now first there's what Paul refers to as the law of the mind. Now this law seems to be for the most part identical with the law of God in verse 22. And this law of the mind takes sides with the law of God. For Paul confesses that with my mind I myself am a slave of the law of God. To put it another way, Paul's inner man delights in God's law. And if you are a true, born again believer, you understand what Paul is saying here. We do give intellectual assent to God's law. We'll read through the Sermon on the Mount and we will exclaim, yes, I want to live like that. We study through the life of Jesus and we exclaim, yes, I would like to be like Jesus. We see that, what would Jesus do? And we say, oh yes, I want to know what Jesus would do. Yes, that's what I would do. Mentally, intellectually, every true Christian side with God on the question of conduct. Now there's 